Welcome to this practice. We're going to be exploring pranayama and meditation. You'll hear me refer to a few Dharma talks that are on our YouTube channel. You can see those here. Those are related to this particular pranayama practice and there are additional resources for you to understand what I'm teaching about. This practice is also happening during our two hundred hour yoga teacher training course. So I'd like the students to understand things like the yoga sutras. I also want them to understand the nature of brain science and yoga. So you'll hear me talk about top-down, bottom-up processing and why that is so important to help us in overcoming the three malas, greed, anger, and delusion. It should be a practice that helps you to feel more informed about pranayama, but also grants you access to your deep, quiet, inner nature, that which is already within you. Let me know how it goes and I'll see you in the practice. Welcome to Pranayama Practice. Let's start with a comfortable, quiet, meditative seat according to your body and your needs. So I am sitting with my sitting bones on the ground and then the blanket is just behind the base of my sitting bones. So not very much support, which means I'm closer to the ground. Better for apana vayu. But you may need more support than that. You can organize according to the needs of your hips and your pelvis and your well-being. This seated cross-leg position when you line the heels up like so is called Siddhasana. Siddha means powers or um, a kind of strength beyond the normal. Siddhasana, the power to meditate, for example. When you cross the legs, it's called Sukhasana, which means the easy pose or easy posture doesn't mean that it's easy to do, but it means it's opposed to be at ease, to take a seat, an easy seat. And in Sukhasana or Siddhasana, it is recommended to sit in this format for meditation, for pranayama, for eating, because it focuses us, it localizes the blood supply into the pelvis during digestion and eating. And it also tends to give us a closer relationship to the ground and the earth from where the food is growing. So for eating purposes, we also sit like this. For meditation, for pranayama, we take the seat because it grounds the pelvis. It gives us a base. We are more connected to muladhara chakra and more connected to apana vayu, the downward flow of prana that helps us to be stable, grounded, rooted. You can rest your hands in your lap. Allow your eyes to close. As you drop down into your seat and also raise up through the length of your spine, gently lift the base of your skull and tip your chin slightly down and in towards your throat. You could imagine that you have a kind of inward turning attention towards the heart. So your gaze can be down past the bridge of your nose inwardly towards the heart center. It's called the Anahata, Anahata Chakra. And the slight tipping of the chin down and in towards the throat is a mild form of Jandahara Bandha. So you have Mula Bandha at the base of your seat, and Jalandhar Bandha gently set in the throat. This is to help us concentrate our energy and to be less pulled away by the vrittis, the cyclical fluctuations of the mind. Allow your attention to rest on the simple observation of the breath coming and going. We can recognize at the start that no two breath cycles will be identical. 
just like no two snowflakes are the same. So we're watching, but not assessing. We're not even coordinating, we're simply observing. As you're observing the movement of the breath and not coordinating it, also release yourself from judging, narrating, or critiquing. The nature of the restless mind will apply itself to anything. It can grab onto any activity in daily life and express its restlessness. So even simply observing the breath, you may find that your restless mind is commenting, distracting, traveling off, returning, judging, efforting, refocusing, losing focus, and so on. So allow restless mind to be its own entity for a time and focus on the observing quality, free from judgment, consistent, kind observation. You may observe as if you were a scientist watching an experiment. Notice how the breath responds when judgment or urgency enter. And how your breath responds when you release judgment or urgency. At any time where you get tangled into the cyclical nature of the mind, in other words, the vrittis, then simply return your attention to observing without being entangled and without judgment 
or urgency. Practices observing or resting in the seer, observing that which is being seen, the movement of the breath, getting, of course, distracted, potentially intruded upon by vrittis, and noticing again that you are the seer, practicing seeing the movement of the breath. So you may move through that several times to strengthen the seer, the drastu, so that you're able to simply witness and not get tangled in the vrittis. Please raise your hands to your heart. Acknowledge the efforts you were making. And I'll take a little sticky note and make notes to the side. So when we come back to meditation after pranayama, you'll be able to sense the difference in your capacity to simply meditate. Sahanavavatu, Sahanao Punaktu, Savidyang Karavavai, Tejasvinavari Tamastu, Mavidveshavai. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Punaktu Savidyang Karavai Tejasvina Vari Tamastu Mavidveshavai Sahana Vavatu Sahana Punaktu Savidyang Karavavai Tejasvina Vari Tamastu Mavidveshavai Shanti Shanti Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om You may bow your head to your heart. Release your hands as you're ready to and open your eyes. So we set up the conditions as well as we can, resting in this uh, muladhara, the root chakra, with attention to the anahata, the heart chakra, a felt sense of the ground beneath us that we can access and feel rooted or connected to. Muladhara is the first chakra representing the earth element and mulabandha, is the base of the bandha. So it's the first of the locks or the seals for our energy. 
when we gaze toward the heart, we have John the Harabanda giving guidance. We are not in a full John the Harabanda, which we'll do in practice here in Pranayama. We are in this gentle tipping inward quality. We make our best circumstances, including how we eat, how we sleep, the nature of our life, its simplicity or busyness, or the compulsions or the reflections we do, all that we can. So we come to take a seat in meditation and we arrive with less to work out and therefore a greater opportunity not to be digging ourselves out of some hole of vrittis, but to be on level ground from where we can experience meditation more naturally, which is called sahaj, the naturalness of meditation. Of course, we also do hear directly in the Yoga Sutras that by the fourth Yoga Sutra in the first Padha, we are learning that, you know, it's likely that we're distracted by vrittis, these um, movements of the fluctuations of the mind. So what is described as yoga in the Yoga Sutras? Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga is the cessation of, or the restriction of, or the, we could say, dissolving of, narodaha, the fluctuations, vritti, of consciousness, of the mind, of the chitta, the activities of mind. Yoga chitta vritti narodaha. When that occurs, when we're able to accomplish that, then ada vrastu being resting in the seer, svarupe, this blissful nature, avastanam, we are established there. Ada drastu svarupe avastanam. We are resting in that experience. And then itaratra, well, at other times, <laughs> we're likely to be caught up in the fluctuations of the mind at all other times. We are subject to those fluctuations. So knowing that is happening and the likelihood of that, we're already just at the fourth yoga sutra. We want to practice pranayama to help us to experience what is discussed in the first three sutras. And the very first sutra, by the way, is Atta yoga nusasanam. And now, after all these experiences and this, we might say boga. Boga means experiences and the pursuit of pleasure. After all of this boga or experience, including the suffering when pleasure dissipates or disappears or is unattainable, after all of this punya and apunya, pleasure and unpleasure, displeasure or unpleasant, after all of this klishta and aklishta, all of these difficulties and the release of difficulties, after the cyclical nature of life in the mind, then we turn to yoga. The yoga is now going to begin. Now we make a dedication. Because we've seen that that isn't that effective. The boga or the pursuit of those things has not met our deepest driving desire. If you'd like to learn more about this and you're listening to this discussion on YouTube, there is a Dharma talk available to you that was recently done and you can see that link here. So for the pranayama to be effective, we have come without food in our stomachs and we have come without previously in the morning scrolling or you know news or broad broadcasting things and not exposing ourselves to too much of the riffraff of the opportunities of the mind. If we have exposed ourselves to those things and we need a little settling in, we can do practices that help us with that too. So we'll do some preliminary practices that are gonna give us greater access to the beauty of pranayama. So I'm going to ask you to clasp the hands together, press the heels of your hands forward, broaden the back of your waist, and round your spine into cat pose, the cat pose. Spine. And then lift your chest and heart, bring the hands towards the heart, and open the spine like a cow pose spine. And this will be the inhale. And then exhale, push forward, round your back. Inhale. And exhale, as you're pressing forward, broaden your shoulder blades, broaden your lower back. 
As you inhale, lift your chest and heart, squeeze the shoulder blades together, open your throat. Exhale, push forward. Inhale. And exhale. Now inhale, raise up and look up. And exhale, bring the heels of the hands facing down as you gaze down. Inhale, press up and look up. Exhale, palms facing down, hands behind your head. Inhale, look up. Exhale, gazing down. So most of the spine is neutral and stable. On the inhale, as you're pressing up, you'll have a little more thoracic extension. Open the heart. But the most movement is happening in the head, neck, and throat. Let's inhale one more time to reach up. And exhale one more time coming down. And keeping the chin down towards the throat. Press the elbows back. Squeeze the shoulder blades towards each other. Imagine that you're pulling the hands apart. But they're going to stay connected. As you keep the chin down, this is more of a full Jalandhar Bandha. Lift the base of your skull and press the very base of the skull back into your fingers. Your pinky fingers are right there. And notice that even in Jalandhar Bandha, the back of the throat has a hollow place through which you can breathe. And see if you might be able to have a full thoracodiaphragmatic breath. That means that the inhale begins in the pelvis, includes the mid torso, rises up to your heart and to your shoulder blades. On the exhale, begin at the base of the belly, rolling the exhale up through the spine, through the inner belly, towards the heart. And one more exhale. Release your hands and arms down. Relax the mind and take notice when you come back to your seat. You can observe the nature of the vrittis. Are they more smooth, quieter, less bothersome? Also notice your connection to witnessing or observing. Are you more connected to the seer, Rastu, as a result of just a few breath cycles? Now place the left hand on the floor nearby and the right palm face up. As you inhale, breathe into the right low belly, mid and then upper. So we're going to go like this, breathing in. And then exhale, side bend. Then inhale, right low belly, mid torso, upper chest and heart. And exhale, use the right low belly to rise up and lower your right arm down. And then repeating, inhale. And exhale. So we want the length of the movement when you're in movement to be equal to the length of the breath. Now we're resting here. So inhale, first, third, middle third, upper region of the torso on the right side. And then exhale, rise up.
and release your right arm down. One more, so inhale, here's the breath filling up at the pace of the movement of your arm. We're at the top of the movement, at the top of the breath, and then exhale. Breathe in. And exhale, draw up while rooting down through the right low belly. Use the full length of the exhale to rise up and then lower your right arm down. Other side, turn the left palm up, breathe in. And exhale. Inhale at your body's pace. Exhale, rise up using the left low belly. The left hip has stayed grounded, so that doesn't get reestablished so much as you get reacquainted with it. So don't let the hip become uprooted when you side bend. Inhale. Using the full length of your breath, exhale, side bend to your right. Breathe in, the left hip is still grounded. And then exhale, using the left low belly to come up. Lower the left arm down. I'll do one more. and lowering down. And let's check again and see now, what is the quality of your observer self? More present, perhaps more loving, free from judgment. You might also observe how crowded is the observer by the vrittis. How crowded is the marketplace of your mind? Do one more practice as a preliminary to formal pranayama. But what these two practices and the next one have in common is that we are synchronizing the movement with the breath. We're also focusing on different regions of the body. So in the first one, it's opening the front spine and the back spine, opening the east side of the body and the west side of the body. On the second, we're opening the left and the right side, you know, movement side to side, and we're asking for each region of the torso to get some of that breath, to be awakened by that. So we're requesting of the inner body that we can functionally, skillfully allow prana to get rebalanced inside. So in the next practice, we're also gonna synchronize the movement with the breath. Not only are we addressing prana in this way, but we're asking the neocortex, this is the upper wise center of the brain, we're asking that to help us coordinate movement, breath, sensing, observing. That is called top-down neocortex, bottom-up lizard brain, brainstem, top-down bottom-up processing. 
And this top down, bottom up processing is what I like to say is like soothing the limbic brain. It's like being an amygdala whisperer, asking the amygdala to, you know, quiet down. So when the limbic brain is more balanced and it's right size, we are less likely to be pulled into the three malas, which were discussed in that Dharma talk recently. Those three malas are greed, anger, and delusion. And whether that delusion is mild misperception or you know gross delusions of um, our self-importance or of our place in the world or of other people, what they're doing, it could be very dramatic, but it could be also very subtle. Misperception is the root of delusion. And greed is something we are all familiar with in both, we can have it in small ways, we can have it in grandiose ways. Sometimes greed is wanting that, like one more minute of Shavasana, for example. Grasping, a patigraha, wanting something. Right? So greed, anger, and delusion. And ang anger is something that is actually a reaction. It's in the human system, but it's a reaction to undigested, moods, thoughts, emotions, fear, terror, and a, a sense of great disconnection from life itself. So anger looks different than that when we look at you know human behavior and interactions. It looks like you've offended me, um, but I'm more easily offended if I'm also disconnected from the great presence that is infusing us all. I'm more easily offended and upset and outraged. Also, if I believe what you are saying about me to be offensive. And if I have a limited perspective of who I am and what I'm capable of, I'm more likely to fall prey right, to anger as well. So the limbic brain generates those greed, anger, and delusion. And this practice of top-down, bottom-up processing quiets the limbic brain. And that's why we can have greater access to a loving witness from up above here. So on this one, let's take the left hand across to the right thigh. Take the right arm out in front. Okay, and on the inhale, open to your right. Exhale, place the right hand down and secure the twist to your right. Inhale, reach your right arm around, come forward, stretch the back of the body. Okay, exhale, bring your right hand down, gaze down, stretch open the back of the body. Inhale, raise your right arm, open the heart, twist to your right. Exhale, place the right hand down and secure the twist for greater rotation. Inhale, sweep your right arm wide, come around, you're opening the back hemisphere of the body. Exhale, you may actually be able to hold on to your right ankle. Inhale. Exhale, rotate. Inhale, raise your right arm, come forward. And exhale. And then we'll switch sides. So first pause and notice your body may feel kind of asymmetrical, like a swoosh. I'm just gonna check a setting, pardon me for a moment. Okay, now bring the right hand across. Yeah, and left arm forward. Let's inhale to open. Exhale, touch the left hand down, secure the twist. Inhale, raise your left arm. As you come forward, broaden the back hemisphere of the body. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale, place the left hand down. Inhale, raise your left arm, come forward, broaden the space between the shoulder blades. Exhale, gaze down. And last one. Exhale, 
exhale. Inhale. And exhale. And then rest your hands on your knees. And notice again, what now is your access to observing? See if you can glimpse the quietude of the mind. And even a quality of physical stillness may also be there. And now we'll practice more formal pranayama. So I want to underline that you're not creating something that doesn't already exist for you. As I said in the Dharma talk, consciousness is not elusive, it's available. What we're doing is cultivating our capacity to recognize that, to remember that, to be reunited with that. And in that cultivation, we have to make some effort because we have to overcome the vrittis or the residue of daily life. And so there is a practice involved in this, but it's not that you have to practice in order to attain that or to you finally be gifted with it. Consciousness is available to us always. It's not elusive. Our ability to be connected to it is what's elusive. So we're practicing giving, um, messages to the limbic brain, like, you know, right now all is well, you don't have to set us onto alert or emergency or freneticism or haste or rushing or any of those things. We're not grasping, we don't have to acquire, we don't have to go out and consume or get more stuff to feel okay or pump up who we are to have a sense of place in the community. We're telling the limbic brain it's okay. We really want to know the higher self. So as you're sitting, you may, of course, adjust your legs at any time, but as you're sitting, this is our pranayama position. So we'll start with a formal pranayama of ujjayi. So you'll place the tip of the tongue behind the top two teeth, make the back of the throat hollow. And as you're breathing here, we will use Jalandahar Bandha now. We've had enough movement, you're prepared enough. So we'll use Jalandahar Bandha. And I'm gonna ask you to also balance the length of your inhale with the length of your exhale. So place your hands on your knees. You may choose this mudra if you like. Lift the base of your skull. Bring your chin down towards your throat. And begin the whispering sound of the ujjayi breath. We want the breath to be three-dimensional, low belly, mid-torso, upper chest and heart. So it's a full thoracodiaphragmatic breath. And you want the exhale to be gently complete. To balance the length of your exhale with your inhale, focus on slowing down the first part of your exhale, not forcing the last part of the exhale.
do two more breath cycles, keeping Jalandahara Bandha and keeping the smooth sound of the breath as an accompaniment to the counting of the breath. When you complete the last ujjayi, then rest your hands in your lap, release Chandahara Bandha, and sit quietly. going to practice Durga Pranayama and we'll do it with the interruptions and sometimes those interruptions we call that going against the grain so it's a, a form of Veloma Pranayama and Durga Pranayama means three-part inhale so we'll inhale first third and then we'll pause inhale middle third and then pause inhale upper third and then pause my recommendation is that you inhale for a count of three, however fast or slow you're counting that, and pause for three, inhale three, pause three, because it's an easy number to work with. At the top of that inhale, you'll also be pausing for three. And then you can exhale either for a count of nine, which equals the length of those inhales added up, or you can eventually exhale for the length of 18, which equals the amount of time that the inhale then took. Again, counting at your own pace. Okay, we do use ujjayi pranayam in this case, and you can also come into jalandahara bandha. So beginning when you're ready to, tip of the tongue behind the top two teeth, the back of the throat hollow. Let's inhale first third. Pause. Middle. Pause. Upper, pause, exhale from the base, exhaling up the front of the spine, the exhale goes out through the nose, we maintain the Jalandahara Bandha. And then counting at your own pace for inhale three, pause three, inhale three, pause three, and so on. When you're inhaling for three at the low third, and then you pause, there'll be a gentle tone to the belly, the throat, and the pelvic floor. When you get to the second third, and you're holding that, the tone's gonna increase during the suspension. 
You get to the upper third and you're gonna need more tone to hold that suspension. That'll feel like a more complete Jalandahar Bandha. It will include an Uddiyana Bandha, though you're holding that during inhale suspension. Maintain the head posture of Jalandahar Bandha, even as you're exhaling. So you're not gonna uncap that for the exhale, but rather maintain that. It's like a position, like the hood of the cobra, but you're gazing in towards the heart. Do three more rounds, which is three breath cycles. For those of you who are getting comfortable with the uppermost inhale, and for whom your Jalandahar Bandha feels comfortable, and the suspension for three counts is comfortable, you could increase that to six or to nine count. And then again, exhale for the pace of nine, 12, 15, up to 18 if you're able to. Don't force anything. That'll be more like greed, right? One of the three malas, it's like greed. So don't force anything. Be in harmony with yourself as you practice. It'll cultivate your pranayama more deeply and more sustainably. At the end of your next exhale, then release Jalandahar Bandha in a formal sense and sit quietly once again to notice what is happening with your mind. Where are the vrittis? And what connection do you have to the seer, drastu? Now bring the right hand up, come into Jalandahar Bandha, and we'll come to Nadi Shodhana. So place the right thumb and ring finger from the top of the nose, not down here like this, pulling down. Come into Jalandahar Bandha and then place your thumb and ring finger so it's not weighing your head more heavily down. Right, And we will be alternating which nostril we breathe in and breathe out. That's why it's called alternate nostril breathing or Nadi Shodhana. Nadi Shodhana begins with inhale left, then exhale right, then inhale right, and exhale left. That'll be one cycle. Begin as you're ready to.
We are not using ujjayi during Nadi Shodhana. You can pace the in-breath and the out-breath to be equal. You could also pace the exhale to be longer than your inhale. the end of your next exhale through the left nostril, you can release the practice, release your right hand down, release the Jalandahara Bandha, and keep your the base of the skull lifted for meditation and the gaze in towards the heart, but you don't need the formal Jalandahara Bandha. You may find when you come to your meditation seat that the breath is very shallow, perhaps even imperceptible. My hope is your vrittis have faded or given you some space and you can experience that indwelling seer.
Please raise your hands to your heart. Acknowledge your efforts and the practice. Also acknowledge the outcome, the influence of the pranayama on your ability to rest in simple meditation. Meditation is considered more powerful than pranayama. Pranayama is more powerful than asana. And so thank you for being here in this practice and sharing your efforts with the community. Namaste. And something fortunate to keep in mind is that there are only five kinds of vrittis. <laughs> There's only five pancham, there's only five vrittis. That means that all these vrittis that we see as so many multitudes can be summarized by five of those. And you learn those in the next Yoga Sutras. You say, oh, there's only five kinds of vrittis. They are categorized into deeply conditioned or deeply colored and less deeply conditioned or less deeply colored, free from that. So mired in conditioning, klishta, mired in deep coloring, or free from conditioning, free from the deeply colored thoughts, aklishta. And then we learn there are five of those. So, uh, and the five are pramana vipadiyaya vikalpa nidra smittaya. So pramana, clear perception. This is recommended. Vipadiyaya, misperception. This is very common. <laughs> Vikalpa, memory, excuse me, a fantasy or imagination, like daydreaming off, off in the, you know, the hitherlands. <laughs> Vikalpa, imagination, somewhat recommended, but not a place to be when you're meditating. Nidra is sleep, being asleep or, you know, going unconscious to things or unconscious to life, we could say. So also not recommended when you're meditating. That is uh, pulling you under. Right? And then smithy means uh, memory or being caught on the past impressions, smithy. So those are the five. And there are there's a Dharma talk about that as well. So you can see those. You can go to those practices next if you'd like to. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for sharing your practice with me and with the community. I do hope this has been helpful to you. If you have questions or comments, please leave them down below the video. As always, if the practice is helpful to you, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That's very helpful to us. In this practice, you were exploring variations of pranayama on the way to having a more clear mind. If you're curious about the Dharma talks that I was mentioning, please check the descriptions in the conversation below this video. Also, if you're interested in yoga teacher training school and understanding how yoga philosophy integrates with these practices of asana, pranayama, and meditation, please check out the link for the teacher training school here. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again.